Hello again, and welcome back to Fire and Film. This is the first of two episodes covering one of the first set texts on Paper 2, District 9. District 9 was released in 2009. District 9 utilises both handheld camera and found footage techniques at the start of the film to create a sense of realism, making the audience believe what they are seeing is true. However, the film abandons this later on and resorts to using more standard ways of film production. So why are we studying District 9? As you know, Paper 2 of the Film Studies GCSE focuses on films from all around the world. Question 1 on Paper 2 is a question on a global English language film. For this question we need to consider the use of all elements of film form in District 9, as well as the context surrounding the film. As well as these required elements, there is a narrative focus for this question, meaning that we'll be typically asked to consider the use of narrative, narrative structures and theories in relation to District 9. The typical layout of question 1 and all other questions on paper 2 are 3 or 4 stepped questions about either the focus for that film, so in this case narrative, some element of film form, cinematography, sound, editing, mise-en-scene or contexts, and how they are used in District 9. You'll first be asked to identify an element and then briefly describe it. You may be asked to discuss how this element is typically used before creating a 15 mark response, which is usually an overall exploration of that question's specific focus, so narrative, representation, aesthetics or contexts. I'm not going to go through what would be model or exemplar answers now because that will be a whole other podcast, but I will go through what will become some reoccurring pointers for tackling these exam questions. First of all, the idea of these stepped questions are that they ease you into writing longer responses, but also that they link in with each other. Finally, this might seem obvious, but the term from your chosen film has known to throw people off or confuse them in the past. There are a total of five films or five pairings of films that the exam board provide us teachers with. We then pick one of these films or pairings to teach you, for you then to answer the questions on the exam about. So for this question, your chosen film is District 9. So where can you find District 9? The film is available to buy online for $6.99 from iTunes, Sky Store, Google Play and Matukan. You can also rent the film from these providers for about half the price. If you would prefer the old school way of doing things, a new and sealed copy of the DVD is £6 and the Blu-ray is just a pound extra from Amazon. There are also lots of clips scattered on YouTube, on both the Movie Clips channel and once again on Ian Moren on Malgar's Film Studies Fundamentals channel. I mentioned earlier that District 9 utilises a distinct style of cinematography to begin with. This is achieved through a number of different techniques including handheld camera, which is simply where the camera operator holds the camera during shooting, as opposed to securing it on a tripod to create a jerky immediate feel. Another technique is the use of found footage. The events on screen are typically seen through the camera of one or more of the characters, often accompanied by their real-time off-camera commentary. For added realism, the cinematography may be done by the actors themselves, as they perform, thus leading to shaky camera work. The footage may be presented as if it were raw and complete, or as if it had been edited into the narrative by those who found it. Found footage was a huge fad throughout the 2000s, typically used in horror films. District 9 utilises both handheld and found footage techniques at the start of the film to create that sense of realism that I mentioned before. This makes the audience believe what they are seeing is true. Some context surrounding the film then, so we'll start off with the institutional contexts. District 9 is adapted from Neil Blomkamp's earlier short film Alive in Joburg that was released in 2005. After the feature film based on the Halo video game series which was to be directed by Neil Blomkamp fell through, producer Peter Jackson went to Blomkamp and offered him $30 million to make whatever he wanted. The result was District 9. And District 9 was the first documentary style film to be nominated for the Best Picture Oscar. Some social context then. So the basis of many sci-fi films is that the conflict between the self, humans, and other, aliens. Most early sci-fi and horror films have very simplistic narratives in which the humans fight an alien or an other, identifiable by its strange appearance, behaviour or values. Usually the humans defeat the other and reassert the self that the audience can identify with. District 9 creates a problem with this relationship. Though at first the prawns do seem completely alien in their appearance with disgusting habits and incomprehensible language, we are soon encouraged to empathise with Christopher and his son. After Vickers is infected, he begins to literally turn into the other. Aliens infecting and transforming a human is a typical convention of the horror genre. Yet as an audience, we don't fear him. Instead, despite his mutated appearance, he becomes our point of identification and an unlikely hero. In fact, as Vickers' transformation continues, he becomes more heroic. First he escapes the lab, 
and then he bravely joins Christopher in an assault on MNU and finally sacrifices himself so that Christopher and his son can escape. At the same time, the other humans become more and more inhumane. The revelation of the labs where the experiment on the aliens and the single-minded pursuit of Vickers by Venter are all good examples of this. Some cultural context and specifically racism. Think about the use of the word prawn in District 9. It's colloquial, it's slang, it's insulting. It's reflective of xenophobia, the dislike or the prejudice against other people from other countries. It's reflective of the social segregation, so the separation or the isolation of a race, a class, an ethnic group enforced by voluntary residents in a restricted area, which links us nicely to the political and historical context surrounding the film. The treatment of the aliens is an obvious metaphor for the South African apartheid system that functioned between 1948 and 1991. This was a system of racial segregation and discrimination that treated black Africans as lower class and prevented them from mixing with white South Africans socially or publicly. It also prevented black people from accessing housing, employment or educational opportunities. Between 1960 and 1983, over 3.5 million non-white South Africans were forced to leave their home and were resettled in segregated neighbourhoods where poverty and crime were rife. One of the most famous examples of this was the resettlement of 60,000 non-white people from the Sophia town area of Johannesburg, where District 9 is set. In the early hours of February 9th, 1955, heavily armed police began forcibly evicting people, bulldozing their homes and moving their belongings 19 kilometres away to what would later become the township of Soweto. It is this event that the start of the film is heavily referencing. One of the first legal acts of apartheid was to forbid marriage between black and white South Africans and sexual contact between them was considered a taboo. This is referenced in the smear campaign accusing Vickers of contracting his affection from having sex with the aliens. The name District 9 is also a reference to an area called District 6 near Cape Town. This was also the scene of a mass resettlement in the 1960s. One of the main languages of those dwellings was Kosa, which incorporates many vocal cliques similar to the aliens in the film. The humans only signs used to promote the film are also a reference to the whites only sign from the apartheid era. So thinking about narrative, District 9 follows a linear narrative structure. It features characters with multiple traits that make applying props spheres of action, so the hero, the donor, the princess, somewhat confusing. The character of Grey Bradnam at the beginning of the film is the personification of Bath's Enigma Chords. The Enigma is a useful narrative device to keep the reader, or in this case the viewer, interested by whetting his or her appetite to find out more. The narrative will establish enigmas or mysteries as it goes along, essentially the narrative functions to establish and then solve these mysteries. Enigmas are very common in thrillers and horrors whereby the victim is trying to solve the murders, or figuring out why the mayhem is occurring, or even who the villain is. Narrative devices are used to raise questions in the audience's mind and compel them to continue to watch the film. We're posed a lot of questions in the opening sequence, including what has happened to Vickers, who confiscated Vickers' equipment and why, why did the alien ship stop at all, why did the alien stop over Johannesburg, what fell from the ship, and if these are the drones, then what happened to the leaders? Foreshadowing is a literary device in which a writer gives an advanced hint of what's going to come later in the story. Foreshadowing often appears at the beginning of a story or a chapter, and it helps the reader develop expectations about upcoming events. In this respect, foreshadowing is similar, but not crucially the same as cause and effect. Chekhov's gun is a dramatic principle that states that every element in the story must be necessary, and irrelevant elements should be removed. Elements should not appear to make false promises by never coming into play. If it's mentioned, we'll come back to it. So the scene specifically for this is Vickers finding the fluid. He walks and he says, don't touch anything. He doesn't listen to his own advice. He touches something, he becomes infected, he transforms into one of the aliens. I'm going to go through some more narrative additions and how they link to District 9 in the full film commentary that's going to come later this week. Thank you very much for listening to the required learning for District 9, and I'd just like to thank and credit Ian Moreno Melgar for his exemplary knowledge organiser that provided a lot of the content for this episode. I'll be back, like I said, at the end of this week with a full film commentary for District 9 to support this required learning and your revision for Paper 2. You can help support Firing on Film by following us on Twitter at Firing on Film, by liking us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Firing on Film, and leaving a five star review at your favourite podcast provider. Stay safe, look after each other, and I will see you next time.